Hey everyone, thanks for stopping in and seeing what I'm up to. My name is Nikki B, and I am so glad you're here with me. Let's continue with Borderline Personality Disorder, The Complete Guide to BPD, Tools, Techniques, Control, Your Emotions, Angers, and Depression. Chapter 30, Coping with the Stigma Associated with Borderline Personality Disorder. Today, rejection is one of the most difficult feelings for people with this condition. It seems like they lost all of their lives, that they have died inside and are plunged into the dark nightmare of a depression of loss. This world is called Negredo by the alchemists, and in dreams it appears as destruction, collapse, chaos, etc. This is a very hard experience to be accepted by anyone so that you can understand how tough it is for someone who has a borderline disorder or what psychologists term an extremely fragile ego. It is not easy to have a borderline personality disorder in general. All feels fragile and volatile. One of the reasons is that a very young and very damaged part of the personality Another explanation is that the personality has not yet fully fused. During ordinary personality development, we incorporate a view of ourselves and the world as part of what Jungian psychologists call the ego, somewhere between two and six. So, we believe that we are special people. I'm a good little girl, and I like to be helpful, or I'm a bit of a naughty girl, and I enjoy having a lot of fun, and so on. The knowledge of ourselves, things that we don't like, falls into what Jung called the shadow. This is a sound system. Such adjustment does not occur in those who have a borderline personality disorder. Thus, what you are left with is a whole series of complexes, sub-personalities or ego states, and the adult is rather fragile. So the person continues to slip between the dominance of one complex and another. One minute you may feel proud of your work and then you will be able to see that you made a mistake and then you will turn into a system in which you are governed by another complex in which you are feeling like the biggest failure ever on earth. This uncertainty is generally expressed in all its facets. For example... People with borderline personalities often don't know what their lives are. Part of the problem is that different parts can want different things. One part might need to be imaginative. Another might need protection. Another could be interested primarily in power. And one-fourth could have a religious interest that clashes with everything else. To worsen everything, any element will prevail at any time. For example... The part that is interested in spirituality may want to retreat and get excited and reserve it, and then the region that is afraid of being lost as it approaches may be afraid to leave alone. Such personality changes will occur hundreds of times a day, making it difficult to live a person's life with this condition. In the context of these people, there is also a significant incidence of sexual abuse, and many believe that repeated trauma, including sexual abuse, are part of the cause of this disorder. I think it works like this in the case of many women. As a son, they didn't meet their needs for a trustworthy, caring, and unconditional parent. It made them need this good mothering for a lifetime. By trying to find it, they will meet people who are very broken by their sexuality and who find their closeness and trust sexually enticing to them. Such men then take advantage of the girl's need for love by fulfilling her sexual needs. Part of the girl is so desperate for the love, that's all with it, but another part knows it's not okay and it's traumatized. Individuals with such an experience as children tend to confuse sexuality and love, and as young people and adults try to meet their maternal love requirements through sexual relationships, which often do not work. There are, of course, many more horrible cases than this in which the need for affection of the child takes them to circumstances in which they are exploited far more gravely. If the violence is very severe, it will probably result in a multiple personality disorder rather than a specific personality disorder. Another historical explanation for people living with a BPD is that because their ego was so fragile and their emotions so intense, certain experiences that might not traumatize others could have humiliated someone on their way to developing a BPD. Take as an example a boy of four 
who was badly mothered at an early age with many abandonments. And look at the situation where his mother took him to school for the first time. Now many kids are finding it difficult, but most coping, and the accident is not left as a trauma. What would continue to happen to our little boy is that he would undergo a devastating abandonment reaction, which would create such an overwhelming feeling, and that the event would then linger as part of a series of painful abandonment memories. Such a child would, in many ways, build a whole library of traumatic memories, abandonments, treacheries, and violence. Most or all these experiences can be the kinds of experiences we all experience, like college, losing friends, moving home, someone with us, and so on. Nevertheless, their emotional response to these events overwhelms their fragile egos to an emerging borderline personality and causes more traumatic memories. As I said, developing a borderline personality disorder is not easy, and they often view themselves like people who fight in life. This war also comes into their dreams. There will be a sign of things coming together, like a marriage dream and their visions of things falling apart again, divorces, disintegration, etc. And that's how it goes. It's hard to get it all together, and then it falls apart again. Individuals with a borderline disorder of personality often tend to experience a tremendous amount of shame, which stems from their history of not being accepted. When their ego is very gross and delicate, they tend to avoid disgust at all costs because it is a tragedy. Of example, if something goes wrong, they tend to protect themselves against the embarrassment of blaming others. And this may be a very annoying aspect of living in someone with a borderline personality disorder. Say you're engaged to someone with a question like that. You will, at times, be in a position either to accept unfair blame or go through the fight to get the fault back where it belongs with all the consequences that come from, because if your partner takes the blame, then he or she will possibly crumble into a part of him, her, that retains a very negative perspective on himself. Why am I such a goddamn? This method is complicated for both involved people. A related problem with borderline personality exists in counseling. You'll screw sooner or later in your counseling, and this will trigger strong negative feelings, disappointment, resentment, and so on. The thing to do in this case is to listen carefully and reflect without being defensive, even though you think everything you did is right. Later, when the interpersonal problem has ended, the event can be resolved so that it can be viewed from a more reasonable perspective. You can therefore forget an appointment as an example. Sometimes it occurs. As a result, the customer can feel abandoned and angry. On the other side, if you become defensive and say that you are human and believe that their response is totally unrelated to each other's magnitude, then they will remain stuck in the impression that you have made a terrible mistake and if there have been other parts of their experience that have not been liked by them. The deep motive behind this would be to see you suffer as much as you hurt as you see due to your actions. I guess the majority of official therapy reports come from people with borderline personality disorders. So avoid it. All you need to do in the vast majority of situations is to listen and apologize. I agree that the main element of treating people with these problems is to have an experience of unconditional love and acceptance for the first year or two of therapy at least so they have a therapeutic emotional experience. As they get accepted and cared for. They start to question their reactions themselves, and this opens up the opportunities for honest debate of the objective situation, and that is the time for a more realistic view of their reactions. You can do so because your friendship with them strengthens the strength of your ego. The feeling of embracing and caring must first come. The continuing sense of being projected, listened to, looked after, and so forth over time during rehabilitation allows the incremental integration of the various aspects of the personality. This is only a natural part of the process. In other words, since you've set appropriate boundaries, which are vital, and have a careful attitude and spend a lot of time listening and thinking, the cycle of personality recovery unfolds, and your customer will show you how to do the job in that regard. 
Note, in all this, the unconditional constructive thought is not the same as colluding with the regressed aspect of the personality. So, for instance, the reflection mostly would be in the form. You feel like you are devastated by the fact that he's gone, not he's made you feel devastated. Or, he's like a waster on you now and you'll be bitterly disappointed. The focus is thus on the feelings of the client and you do not acknowledge any blame or splitting. In other words, you can accurately reflect the emotional experience of the individual without any distortion of reality. A clear approach towards your emotions must be taken. You will see you in an inflationary way, and this must be recognized as your experience. If you fall from grace, it must also be acknowledged. As I said, they will tell you over time how they are willing to look at their responses more objectively, and that is time to do so. Projection identification is another of the projections used by those with borderline personality disorders. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this security, but I'll try to describe it to those who don't. Projective identification is a simple response when people cannot tolerate very strong feelings. What happens is that those thoughts and behaviors are then isolated and discarded. All this unintentionally happens. Don't ask me how, but it's going to happen. For example, if you feel subconscious that you are a miserable failure, you will feel like a miserable failure in the session. So something you will consider time and again is that when you emerge from a session full of negative attitudes or emotions, wonder if these attitudes and emotions are more relevant to your client. Once you have this understanding, it helps spread the knowledge. However, if you have no perspective, you will sit for days with those feelings. Projective identification is an unpleasant experience, which offers valuable insights into what you are trying to prevent. The cognitive, compatible counselors stress that learning is an important part of the treatment, and I agree that it makes sense. What they know is that these people are struggling not to get frustrated. I have also found that many of them have not known how to deal with strong feelings and therefore prefer to discharge their feelings or try to prevent them from being potentially harmful. If they get really angry, for example, they may break up their flat, which is not an especially helpful way of confronting anger. Chapter 31 Diagnostic Criteria for Dealing with Borderline Personality Disorder When you feel abandoned, you may threaten to commit suicide to try and regain your interest. Also, it's not a very positive long-term strategy. When you feel anger, you can cut yourself off to suppress the emotion. When you feel empty, they will eat, binge eat, or shop too much to try to fill up. When you feel unwanted, you should sleep around to try and feel protected etc. If it feels that you don't want to deal with, you may get drunk or stoned to try and escape or even take an overdose of drugs such as sleeping tablets. These are all negative ways of dealing with emotions and as a psychologist you can encourage them to cope more constructively with these feelings. Marshall Linehan's books are especially helpful in that regard. I think this gives you an idea of the essence of the borderline personality disorder and the way I have worked best with them. Let's just go through the diagnostic criteria to ensure I address the fundamentals and note at least five of them are necessary to make the diagnosis. 1. Frantic attempts to prevent real or imagined abandonment. Note, do not include suicide or self-mutilation because it is protected by criterion 5. Note, I've mentioned how prone these people are to feeling rejected and how difficult it is to deal with these feelings. 2. A pattern of dysfunctional and intense interpersonal relations marked by a alteration of idolization and devaluation extremes. This is the product of the personality division and the security division. 3. Identity disorder. Dramatically and persistently distorted self-image or self-conception. Once because of a personality heterogeneity. 4. Impulsivity in at least two different self-damaging areas, e.g. spending, age, substance abuse, attention, binge food. 
Note, do not include suicidal behavior or self-mutilation, as Criterion 5 excludes it. I've also mentioned these unhealthy ways to cope with strong feelings. 5. Repetitive conduct, acts, or threats of suicide. Today, these are typically compassionate, not because people are bad, but because they genuinely see and hear the self-mutilation activity is generally an effort to dissipate very strong feelings. 6. Affective instability, the emotional instability I mentioned. Because of the marked mood reactivity, for example, extreme episodic dysphoria, irritability, or anxiety usually last a few hours and rarely over several days. 7. Chronic emptiness sensations. As I said, this is a very normal for those with a BPD, but people with this problem usually struggle to cope with this feeling, and it may be very difficult for them to realize they are blank. Some may characterize this as a deep solitude. 8. Inappropriate extreme frustration or anger-controlling challenges, e.g., regular shows of the temper, indignation frequently, repeated physical fights. They have all the issues I have spoken of, of anger or rage, and then difficulties in managing it. 9. Transient stress-related ideation of delusional or extreme symptoms of disassociation. I haven't discussed that. In times of great stress, especially when abandoned, the person can be severely disassociated, so they may get confused lose memory, don't know where they are or who they are, or feel very unreal, or the world may appear to them very unreal. They can also become paranoid in the sense that they are extremely mistrustful and suspect of others. If the only problem is a borderline personality disorder, then these symptoms become temporary, usually only for hours or up to a maximum of a day. I've done my time after more than two decades of working with people with borderline disorder. Nevertheless, I am still very pleased to supervise these research, and I am well aware that all counselors dealing with this challenge require significant assistance. Chapter 32. How to Know if Your Partner Has a Personality Disorder It is difficult to maintain relationships. Under normal cases, conditions that require immediate attention and emotional roller coasters are already very difficult. Imagine if one of these people has a personality disorder which has caused a complete disaster. Sociopathy, borderline personality disorder, or narcissism are the possible personality disorders. It is equally difficult to distinguish between the weird and those who simply have some mental disorders. Such symptoms may not be very obvious, and some people may find them just natural, so there's no underlying reason for such behavior. When the condition reaches uncontrollable levels, these individuals can inevitably do things that they think are irrational, hurtful, or destructive. What are the symptoms of a personality disorder for your partner? 1. No empathy. Although some women consider this to be normal to men, some situations do happen when this no longer applies. It is normal for others to empathize with certain emotionally distressing circumstances of others. Even if your partner displays a short sign of compassion but doesn't grasp the overall weight of the situation just because it's not his own, the sign may not be attractive. 2. Any signs of remorse. When others are in a bad position because of past situations, it is only natural that you feel a certain level of guilt. However, for some with personality disorders, they feel that their weakness is well-deserved. 3. Too much self-worth. If your partner feels superior to others to the extent that he's limited to only those he considers equal to his position, that's not normal. He also should make his accomplishments and successes known, exaggerating them to degrees that would allow him to celebrate things that are actually unparalleled. 4. Compulsive lying. Story lies, big or small, people with disabilities like to make lies. It doesn't matter whether it's important to other people or not. It is done under the premise of possible fun or simply a habit they cannot escape. These guides are not sufficient for you to draw conclusions. It is important to let a specialist see your partner. It's only important to be aware 
that you are not prepared to enter into any relationships, or how to manage one you already have. Splitting. Knowing the narcissists and the borderline personalities, it may be difficult to determine whether you leave a narcissist or a borderline personality since some characteristics combine the two disorders. Splitting is a field with both conditions. Dividing and how things work will help you to understand narcissistic and borderline disorders that help you to deal effectively with them both in and out of court. There is a commonality between the insecure and borderline characters who participate in a splitting phase. Splitting is the term used to describe a subconscious coping mechanism that allows the narcissist to see people as good or bad. When a person divides, he or she cannot see gray areas in an individual, circumstance, or case. It's fine or it's all evil. The best way to do this is to think of a game we sometimes play in boys, cops and robbers. The cops are good while the robbers are evil and have no redemptive qualities. So cops are responsible for saving the world. Gray areas cannot both be handled or recognized by narcissists and unstable personalities, whether in the whole of life or in some other case. If it comes to a person who was idolized the narcissist or the borderline and who ultimately disappoints them, the narcissist or the borderline individual must rapidly restructure his mindset to make him either fuck him or to choose the changed picture of the other guy. The aspect of separation is that they cannot understand that people can experience more than one emotion at a time in the narcissistic and borderline statistics. It's rage or fear. It can't be the two. Three components are required to divide. Unmanaged feelings, all or nothing, all positive or all bad thinking, and extreme behaviors. Because of the intense thought and feelings, an extreme reaction or behavior. Since splitting is not a conscious process, the narcissist or borderline person doesn't know that they do so. It is obvious that a person is splitting and will cause them to react with anger. If a narcissist or weak personality fears that it is relationship it is about to be broken, division increases through fear of abandonment, fear of loss of control, and psychologically unstable. You will be better equipped with this knowledge to explain what your ex does and why he does it. The better you can convey this information to your legal team, the better your custody case is handled. And that's where we're stopping today. Thanks for coming and hanging out with me today. Hit that like, subscribe, comment. Let me know what books you would like to hear. Bye-bye. This is Nikki B. signing off.